So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy that you're all here. This is the last um, session, the last training session in our program. This is session number 10. And we're going to cover the second half of the open results module. So I'm going to start with a few announcements. Um, as you know, the call is going to be recorded and transcribed. So keep your camera on if you don't mind. Um, we are going to upload the video to YouTube in a few days. Um, we also have captions. You can click on the top left um, corner in your Zoom screen. There is a button that says other AI. And if you click on the link, it will take you to the live uh, transcription. Um, so we also have a code of conduct and what we expect from your participation in the OLS community is that you are all considerate and respectful with one another. But if you experience any unacceptable behavior or have any other concerns, um, you can report that by contacting one of the organizers, that is Joe, Malvika, or me. Um, there might be the case where you also need to report an issue involving one of us. So in that case, please um, email one of the members individually. We're going to have a breakout room. So if you prefer to participate by speaking, add an S in front of your name. And if you prefer great and participation, add a W in front of your name. If you don't mind either um, written or spoken participation, please still choose one of those um, so that we know where to put you. And now I'm gonna share my screen just to do a quick recap of, of where we are um, in the program. So let me put this in presenter mode. And Can you see the screen now? Okay, thank you. So as I was saying, we are in the results module and we're gonna cover open access publications and preprints today. Um, and because this is the last training session, uh, we're gonna to bring together many of the concepts that uh, we have been learning about since the beginning of the program, which was, I think it was exactly one month ago. It looks, it feels longer than that. Um, so we're gonna, again, like review even some of the values that are the foundation of open science. Um, and we're gonna kind of use some of the concepts like persistent identifiers and repositories. And hopefully these concepts are starting to sound more familiar to, to everyone. And even though this is the last training session, um, we still have three weeks to go in the program. Uh, the next two weeks are going to be um, dedicated to project presentations. So this is a space for all of you to share what you have learned in the program and also to share the progress with everyone in the cohort. Um, and, and we're very, very excited to hear about your projects. Um, and then in the last week, in week number eight, we're going to have a fun interactive session that's going to be a wrap up and, and goodbye. So I know that there might be several questions about the presentations. Uh, we're gonna spend the last few minutes of the session uh, answering those. If you have a question that, that you cannot wait to ask, please write that in the notepad and uh, we're gonna go back to that at the end of the session. So with that, I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and I'm gonna pass it over to Joe to introduce our expert today. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, and everyone, it's delightful to have you here. Um, Eid Mubarak, if you celebrate. Um, so today, our expert who's leading the call is Daniela. Um, so you will have met her colleague on Tuesday if you came to Tuesday's call. Uh, she works with Monica um, 
And uh, Daniela, it's great to see you again. I'll let, you. let you do the rest of the introductions because you'll do it better than me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a pleasure. I, I feel like the, the stakes are high. It's the last presentation. I hope that some of the, the concepts that we're going to go through um, don't feel super new. Some will feel new. Um, I, I wasn't sure exactly about like where you all are at, but uh, hopefully we can get it together. I'm really happy to be interrupted at any time. We have two activities today. One is going to be right at the beginning. So just like get ready. And it's not going to be breakout for the first one. And just like some activities on the not notepad and a discussion. And then um, we're going to have a little bit more kind of talking through slides and then a breakout session uh, towards the end where it's going to be hands on. Let's go and find out things through a tool. So hopefully um, that's going to be interesting to you all. But again, feel free to interrupt me at any point. And I'm just going to launch my present or launch, uh, start sharing. And then I introduce myself with that. Um, do you see the big presentation? Yes. OK, great. So uh, today is about uh, sharing open results, which is um, sharing is one of my favorite world, uh, world word. Um, and open access publication and preprints. Uh, I am not an expert in open access. Um, I think maybe an expert in preprints by now, uh, mostly preprints review, but so the open access things, hopefully if we can work, work through questions. I think there are other experts here um, that know more than I do. So we can all um, use our collective brain. Uh, you have the link to the notepads, but I wanted to have it in the presentation. All right, so my name is Daniela. Um, Daniela Saderi. I use she, her pronouns. I am um, Italian and I came to Portland in the US, um, Portland, Oregon in the US in 2012 to pursue um, a PhD in neuroscience. So I was really sure that I was going to be a professor and continue uh, into academia. Um, kind of halfway through, I, I, I stumbled upon open, open scholarship movement and like a really uh, fantastic group of people. And some of them are here that inspire me um, to kind of change and try something different still in the in the space but um not at the bench um i um i'm a mozillian uh will always be a mozillian i, I got a, a mozilla open science fellowship in 2019 that allowed me to kind of uh, think about pre-review from a different perspective from what it was just a side project to actually become an organization and then together with uh, Monica, who you met and samantha hindle um we started pre-review and um Right now, we are a team of four full time and then plus uh, Sam and Monica who are in the leadership team. So it's really uh, wonderful. Uh, and I have two kids who keep me very busy and sick all the time. All right. So I wanted to start with, um, you know, like just thinking about like when, where and how do we share our research? And I think that, you know, obviously, uh, through history that have been many different ways. It used to be just, you know, let's send a letter uh, when we didn't have emails to my uh, fellow um, scientists or researcher and kind of share that way. And then we obviously got publications. There is a lot of different ways that researchers have shared, but it, it became, um, you know, obviously more recently uh, in person, like we were able to share our research uh, in, at conferences and meetings so via posters or presentations. But with the um, advent um, of the internet, uh, we find ourselves a lot like sharing our results, um, you know, a virtual computer, I mean, at least on, on a, you know, typing on a computer and then, um, uh, sending them out there and could be all the way from a blog, uh, a tweet, or or not under a tweet, or like so, so sharing on social media via email. Uh, but always the always the the kind of the golden standard for sharing our results is still consider that final publication where we get the stamp of approval, and uh, we can also like call it done in our head, which is a huge thing for researchers. Um, and, and just like go ahead with ourselves and hopefully um, get uh, get a publication in a high impact factor journal where that will be considered more in our um, evaluation. So that is kind of like the, the big picture of, of sharing. But what I really like to start, and then we'll go through some of like the ways that research, research can be shared in, in the publication process, but I like us to kind of step back from what you already know um, about how publication work and think about the why. Like, why do we share? Like, why do a scientist want to share? What, what would be the main motivator? And let's like, again, not think about the practical reasons why, I mean, you can, 
but I like us to kind of break free from that uh, constraints of you know uh, career advancement and things that really think like what would be what would a scientist that is like got into science or got into scholarship and research for their passion want to share with others and list just don't overthink it two or three motivating factors the notepad has those prompts um and then move to the next one pick one of these motivating factors it could be one of a couple of words uh, and then think about if you had to decide when that research should be shared with whom, uh, based sol solely on that motivating factor again, kind of a very yeah, a simple, th think simple, uh, what would that process look like? So we're trying here to think about what is the driving um, force for, for doing the action of sharing. So why do we do it? And then that, how does that drive our decision in this kind of virtual space um, of, where and with whom, um, when and with whom we share our uh, result. Does that does that sound too? Hopefully, I does, that, does anyone have any questions? Again, don't overthink it. This is just a, for us to get, just try to get us in a place that is um, hopefully imaginative. Anyone has questions about this? So I'm gonna go to the prompt. So everyone in notepad, in the notepad, um, activity one, group reflection. We're going to have 10 minutes uh, here with the two prompts. Does that sound good? Or uh, is that how we do it? We can also just, I, I would thought we would just start with silent writing and then go to a discussion. Okay. Then I'll just shut up. But if you're, I'm here for questions and pick up in a, in five minutes. So five minutes of writing and then five minutes of discussion. Great, thanks. So we're halfway through that five minutes for writing. If you want to switch to the next prompt, you can, but also whatever makes sense for you.
Yeah, and do feel free to plus one appreciation or inline commenting. It's always fun. Um, we can take another minute. People are still writing and then we can uh, open up to discussion if we want to share. I love reading this. Thank you all so much. Uh, first of all, I this reminds me how much I love these snowpads and the colors. <laughs> it just gives me so much happiness to see um, free from Google Docs. So like, I, should, I should use this more. Um, but I wonder if anyone would like to just share uh, what they thought. Um, I mean, we all can read it, but if uh, we can have like a little bit of more conversation around this, how did you feel? I see a lot of the answers are still definitely thinking about you know the open results in this world, uh, but also some some others that we have um, experimented more with just like the feeling of being a scientist and the idea of sharing because what I do I am proud of it and I love it and I want my communities to be represented as my work, which is all of this is valid and uh, it's what I was hoping for. So thank you. All right, I'll just see if anyone would like to unmute and uh, elaborate or at least someone else's comment. I do, oh, there's a hand, please. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to quickly put in my two cents. Uh, first of all, great activity. Thanks so much for getting everybody to fill that one in. So um, I just put um, a couple of points down here. Um, I thought, in my personal opinion, um, for researchers like myself, being motivated to share results openly throughout the science community and just in the general public, it has to be based in kind of this mindset of wanting to foster collaboration and ensure transparency. And I think a lot of that's tied to personal ethics. And a lot of it's also tied to kind of the community that we're based in. If reproducibility and transparency are being integrated into our education systems and into our workplaces, I think it incentivizes people to want to be more open about their science. Um, I also went on to say um, on the page that the decision of when to share research and with whom should prioritize advancing knowledge, fostering collaboration and ensure uh, transparency. So when considering the potential impact of sharing this knowledge to different communities, to different researchers who maybe are at a different stage of their research, I think it provides a really good opportunity for people of different backgrounds, different age categories, and even of different disciplines to be able to work together and maybe find some synergy in places that they hadn't found it before. So that's kind of my insight as to where open science should be placed a bigger emphasis on and where I'm happy to see it already growing. That's beautifully said. And I wanna say that um, while you were talking, I was trying to think about what it would have been on myself if I were in that environment as a researcher, if I had left. Like if I were in an environment like what you were saying that actually like definitely my personal ethics, but I could see that that was also valued the environment around me and I wasn't in a particularly bad spot, maybe I would have still be there, which, you know, so it made me almost tear up as you said it. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, all right, then I hope that this set the tone and now we can just hit reality and <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, hopefully it's still going to be inspirational. Um, if you have any more uh, things to add, please add them to the pad of the chat. Um, and let me see what I can share now. Where is, nope. 
my window disappeared. Hmm. Okay, be patient. I'm just gonna stop this. Go back here. Oh, technology. Okay. Here we go. Zoom. I'm done sharing for a minute, for uh, stop sharing for, for a while, so we should be okay. All right, so we left here and now we're gonna move to the next. Um, okay, so this is, um, you know, there are many, many different depiction of the research cycle. This is actually not a cycle, but um, I do uh, like the idea of the cycle because I think that one of the reasons why I like to share on top of what has been said is also the idea that like the, the, the hope that what I'm doing is actually going to be used by others and built on. Um, so I think that the, that should be a cycle. But anyway, this is just a line. Um, and the reason why I put it here is just like, well, it comes from the, the actual module from the NATO tops. But also it's nice how it shows, you know, on the top you have like all of the kind of activities or actions that you do while you're going all the way from your ideation or what your research is going to be like to the end to the sharing and publication and then on the bottom you have the, the the thing the open result that you can actually share but the reality is that a lot of what it's in why can't i Okay, uh, a lot of what happens there uh, the, in the first part of this of this uh, process is not shared, or it's it's shared, but it's shared like in different ways. Like it could be shared like with your department and with your PI, like or um, with your colleagues in a conference, but it's definitely not widely shared. And there is a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of I mean, in my experience at least, like of moving pieces. So, like it's not kind of a straight line from ideation to the the thing. So it's 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 tricky to know how every uh, other researcher does it, and also. So like a lot of what is done there doesn't actually end up being published in the end because it doesn't make a good story because it's not positive um, and um, for, you know, or other reasons, which is a huge loss for the research community. And the, the, the publication, I mean, the last part, like he says, papers, talks, blogs and videos and tweets. But the reality is that researchers really aim for that publication in a high impact factor journal because that's what give us a, keeps us on the job. And so there is this concept of publish or perish, which uh, I'm sure you have heard before. I use this uh, picture also to talk about, you know, it's it's a you often use to, to depict how peer review um, is in this world. So it's like kind of very combative and anxiety driven uh, process of like publishing your research. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that until I'm not going to talk about review right now, but just to say like, that's really what we as researcher, um, are trained to, to, to aim that goal of publish of publishing. However, there is light that are people like you, and there are now more and more people that are recognizing the need for more transparency. And there are many different pilots going on, different practices across publishers and, and funders policy changes. But I wanted to highlight something that is really um, hot of the press. It's actually not on the press yet, so it's really hot, <laughs> but it's coming soon in terms of it's been, there's been kind of small announcements, but the Center of Open Science is, um, is gonna start a pilot for three years so where they are gonna basically, so you see here the standard journal, you have all of these things that happen at the beginning of your you know, process of producing research and none of that actually makes it to the light um, to where other people can see. But um, if, uh, you know, it's only that kind of manuscript submitted to a journal, it gets reviewed, then most of the time reviews, you never see, then you never see them. Um, and then the revised paper, and then until it's published, it's what kind of gets um, uh, explored the most and, and seen by others. But um, in this life cycle journals, they're gonna try basically at every stage of that life cycle of the, sorry, um, of the research cycle uh, to have that um, result or the, the piece of uh, output published and reviewed with a review attached and every single piece is gonna have its own persistent identifier, which I'm gonna repeat what those are. So I'm really actually very excited about this. Um, and you know, it includes preprints and includes a pre-registered report and registration, which I'm gonna tell you in a minute what that is. So it's gonna start from down this year and I'm just really curious to see how, uh, how that's gonna go and what's gonna be the uh, uptake from researchers. 
Um, so a note on pre-registration or registered report, because um, before we hit publications and open access, because there are there has been, especially in the social science and from the Center for Open Science, and Brian Nozick and, and, and other people, um, a push for um, putting out there your idea, your hypothesis, um, and um, you know what you're going to do before you actually do it, which <laughs> sounds uh, radical. Um, so what can I... Okay, so just the definition of pre-registration and registered reports. I've always confused them until yesterday when I actually looked it up. <laughs> In the notes of the presentation, there's a lot more and links to more if you care about. But basically, the pre-registration is just a delay, a detailed plan that you create and you you put it on a on a uh, repository. Um, the Open Science Framework has a repository for pre-registration. It gets a, a, an identifier. And then that's it. it. Once you publish it, it's read only. You can't touch it. Then you go on, you do your research, and you submit it. And then the reviewers, supposedly, that you have to you put that you have the registration, will go and compare with what you said you would do. And this is not a prison. You can change uh, what you've done, but you have to motivate that. Not because oh, actually, oops, um, may that that wasn't a good idea. Like let's try, it. let's change it. And I think that. That happens, right? I mean, I feel like in the, in a space where I value agile iteration, things will change as I do it. But I feel like in my PhD, I spent a lot of time trying to hit a target that I didn't know what the target was. So actually spending more time ahead of time of what it is, and not just for transparency, it's useful for creating collaboration, but also for myself, for like making that, taking that time to plan. Uh, registered reports are similar, but they have two stages of review. So you actually submit your uh, report um, or like your plan uh, to, um, I think it's to, it, it, we'll still get a re registration so with the DOI, but then the journal will accept that. So it will go under review. And it, once it's accepted, that means it's okay. Like whatever comes out um, of that result will be published. And what's going to be reviewed in the second stage? Well, I don't know if that's true for every journal, but like what's going to be reviewed in the second stage is like, how did you, you know, how did that go? Like, just like, can you, are you explaining what changes and what not? And I think that some take this as a way to also make sure that you can, you know, you can publish also the negative results, those like dark side of, of data that um, uh, don't make like a, a, a hip story, uh, which is oftentimes made up in the end after you have collected. So, just wanted to bring this up as these are also ways of sharing um, uh, pieces of research output that are very important. And I think there should be more of this, but um, I haven't seen that much outside of science, social science. I also don't know very much, so I'm learning with you. Um, I know you've already, already learned about persistent identifiers, but here is a refresh. Um, those are awesome. The unique codes for you, if, I hope you all have an ORCID ID. I'm sure you do. Um, and a, a unique uh, code for your data that you put out there and your publication, um, if their organization has also one. Like, and ideally, we would live in a world where all of these things that kind of come together with like the data, with the publication from the organization and the founder uh, link to one another, which I think it's uh, it's still a little bit, It's not. we're not quite there yet, but we're <laughs> aiming in that direction. Um, if you have anything to add, I'm not checking the chat, but um, please, um, again, you, you, some of you know more than I do about this. Oh, I keep losing the mouse. Um, so fun activity. It's not, we're not going to break, um, but I wanted to, if you can use the chat, this is, this is easy, but uh, which one of these four is not a persistent identifier that will persist no matter what? on the internet. So you can put your number, or you don't have to, it's silly, but um, if you do, you can put your number in the chat. Um, which one is the intruder in this PIDs? Two. Yeah. Do you wanna say why? It's a great link, though, Malvika. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can say why. So yeah. I was looking like the ESBN is like a unique number for a thing. The joy, I also know it's a unique number like, to identify something. 
uh, the web archive, I know, don't know much about it, but I also believe there is like a unique number for it. And the GitHub is more a social network where people share, share their projects, which is an amazing open data uh, network, but it's not like a, in the, like a unique, unique identifier number. It, it doesn't point to something that will never change. Um, exactly. Right, thank you, yes. Um, sorry if that sounded condescending. condescending. I know you all knew that. <laughs> it was just a fun thing that was in the, I keep, sorry, my, okay, here we go. Uh, yes, that is the intruder, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, the, yes, the, just the, the others are persistent identifier, the one is a Zenodo, actually that points to the open science-y, um, uh, um, uh, curriculum that we put out and um, that should never never change. Um, the archive, the internet archive captures the snapshots of websites and their links and are really stable. I mean, you know, um, all relative, but, and the IB, um, ISBN is for, um, it's just like um, the books, sorry, numbers for um, standard book numbers. Um, and so, yeah, thank you. So those are great, um, just, a parenthesis into persistent identifiers. But now we're gonna start talking about open access and open access publication. Um, and there's a there are a lot of definitions of open access. And I uh, sometimes I think um, in the past when I first I was confused with open science or like people thinking of open science was all about open access, which is a huge part of open science. Um, the definition of open access, there are many um, here. There is one uh, from uh, the Budapest Open Access Initiative Declaration. It's more than 20 years old. Um, and basically it just requires um, to, to, to be an open access publication, the contribution must not only be useful free of charge, but also um, users must be permitted to copy, use, distribute, transmit, and display the work publicly to make and distribute der derivative works in a digital medium for any responsible purpose subject to proper attribution. Meaning there is a copyright um, that is retained um, by um, the author and there is a choice of licenses that I, yeah, I think there, is a, there are different kinds of licenses that could be chosen and we're gonna see that. And um, the, um, so it's like it, make, it needs to be freely available uh, for usage by others. Now, that's one definition, but as everything uh, in life, and there's also much more to it, uh, much more complexity um, that, and, and, and I, I've also learned this more, yes, like, you know, the last week that I've been looking at this stuff. So there are maybe different colors of open access um, uh, implementations, I would say, across different uh, journals or how it is, um, it is actually um, made, um, made possible. The gold open access has been really talked about and uh, really prominent in the space. Um, and what that is starting from that is like that gives you uh, full immediate open, ac uh, open access um, of the of the manuscript that you submit. But instead of having the readers pay, it's the authors that have to pay via what are called APCs, so the, the uh, article processing charges. And so journals have different amounts of it. Uh, they, they can charge a different amounts for APCs. Uh, it can go all the way to 11,000. I think it's one of the highest for science. Um, so it's definitely any kind of an inequitable way of approaching open access. Uh, and then there have been other kind of variation of open access. I'm just gonna touch on the uh, diamond open access, which is actually full immediate open access. Nobody. Well, someone pays, but it's not the authors and it's not the readers. Is um, either that journal is supported through funders, uh, philanthropy, or uh, coalitions of, of philanthropists, but it's not the authors. So the Diamond Open Access is a much uh, more equitable way. Obviously, people question sustainability for that model. The Green OA is my favorite. Surprise, surprise, because what that allows you to do, well, I don't know if that's my favorite, but like at least. Um, it's basically like, I think it gives more ownership to the author and it's where you can self-archive your uh, copy and that includes preprints as we're gonna see um, in uh, in a bit. And so there is no, no cost to the authors of the readers um, and the authors of publisher, um, usually, you know, the authors chooses the license, especially for the self-archive um, uh, copy. 
that are hybrid and bronze, which I'm not going to talk about, but the notes of this slide have a lot of text and the source for when I got this. I see a lot in the chat and I'm not pausing. Is there anything that I should pause? No, it's Movic and me rubbing each other oh, yeah, in yeah. a cheering <laughs> way, being an imposter. Sorry, <laughs> Pete. Yeah, that was that was not my clever example. Um, it was <laughs> in our in our course. Okay. Um. So then, uh, there are many different tools, and they're getting better and better. Um, and that can be used to um from like by an author, but also by um, publishers and funders to really to check where what is the policy uh, for open access. I, mean, I think here we're just going to think about from the author perspective that wants to publish. And I still feel that as looking at all these tools, and I'm not in the position of being an author that needs to publish before my next evaluation, I felt overwhelmed, <laughs> to be honest, looking at all these tools and, and reading the policies and all of that. Um, and I'm really glad that our librarians out there are helping researchers navigate these. Um, and I uh, I hope that there's going to be more relationship because I um, I love that there are all these tools, but the complexity of navigating all of these policies, I think it's what drives a lot of researchers into just doing whatever they used to um, and figuring it out. But hopefully there is a there is light ahead. Um, because it is complex, we're going to have fun today. <laughs> Use one, a couple of these of these tools um, to check some policies and have a, and just realize some things. That I was looking at them yesterday, I kind of had some revelations. So um, maybe maybe you'll have it too. And uh, the first one, the Directory of Open Access Journal, DOAJ, which I love, and it's a website that hosts um, community curated list of open access journals, and it gives you a lot of information. And we're gonna use, we're gonna break out in groups. I'm gonna tell you more about that. Each one will just use this tool to go and check out the policy um, of that journal. Uh, and then the other one is what used to be called Sherpa Romeo, um, which was. Um, but now it's just like a, they have a new website and Sherpa services. It doesn't matter. But what it is, it's a platform that collects information about the self archiving policies, which is very useful if you want to do green open access, if you really want to, if you want to do preprints. It's less of an issue now that a lot of journals are accepting preprints, but um, it definitely was when I remember learning about Sherpa Romeo first, where like people are like still uncertain if publishing a preprint would be then that you are plagiarizing your work or a journal rejecting because it's not novel. Uh, there are other things that are tools that are there. Um, we're not going to check them right now, but I just thought about having them here for you to um, look up if you want to. Uh, another thing, because before we go into the activity, um, this uh, think, check, and submit um, is also some new resource. This is why I love doing these presentations because I get caught up with <laughs> innovations, and I'm sure I lost. I miss half of it, but um, these also look really cool. It's just um, um, there are many videos, educational videos of you know here is what you can do before you submit your or you choose your your journal. Um, but this it's also a checklist. I am a fan of checklists. I love checklists. Uh, so if you if this could be helpful uh, to anyone um, into like help you think and check, um, and this is also a, a good uh, website for it. Um, the, okay, the director of, so the OIJ, if we're going to use, this is how the uh, website looks like, um, and will look li uh, like to you. So I'm going to give you a couple of, uh, each group will have a name of a journal and you'll plug it into here and then hit search. And then that will spit out, um, uh, well, we'll give you some names. Um, hopefully you pick the first one because it matches your your query and then it will open up a dashboard with a lot of cool information and from then it's going to be um, kind of um, uh, I'm going to give you step by step um, uh, process to go and check um, for some 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 things uh, you'll see it's in the it's in the path one of the thing is checking that using that Sherpa Romeo to uh, to see if there uh, is self-archiving, if there is a possibility for that journal, if it's okay for them to self-archive a version of the submitted manuscript. And it's all in the in the pad. We're gonna go there in a minute, but I wanted to see um, an uplift. I'm really, really excited about the new Sherpa tools. Um, I don't know who owns them. I haven't checked any, if there is black in it, if there is dirt, don't tell me, because I love it. 
um, but the Romeo and Juliet, uh, so Juliet is another tool um, that is actually to check for the policy of the funder, which is also also becoming more, you know, very uh, important as funders are updating their policy on open access, as Gates just announced that two weeks ago, and that they mandate preprints now. So definitely useful to know what your funder um, asks you to do before you submit your publication. Um, we are into the activity, but before um, we, I go through this, I wonder if there is any there are any questions or comments? Did I go too fast? Okay. Too late for that. Thank you. Okay, so activity number two, this is gonna be longer. I think um, we may take a total of 20 minutes in this, um, if that's okay. Well, it's an hour and a half, wait. Mm maybe 15, <laughs> we can do, let me just check. I think we can do maybe um, eight minutes in the breakout and then come back and do a six to seven minutes discussion. I think it's more in the actual activity than it is in the discussion, uh, just to do hands-on. So um, we, can, we can give a good time in the breakout and then come back and share reflection. But um, basically the instructions are also in the pad and um, here just to go over them with, with you together. So you go to the DOIJ website if you can. Um, and then if you can't in your room, maybe ask the person that can to share their screen. I think that should be possible. Um, and then designate you know, um, a person to take notes. Um, but what you are gonna do is that if you're in room one, you just type in eLife in that window that I showed you before, you hit search. Um, and then I pick the first result, which should be the desired journal for this exercise. And then um, you'll have a dashboard that appears with many different tiles. It'll give you a lot of different information. Just look around. There's a lot of cool stuff. I think it's really well designed. It gives you information about the how much money it costs to publish openly. Um, and so some questions you can look at, does the journal have an APC uh, in the, that article processing cost and how much is it? Uh, not that I, I will check the answer, but just like for you to practice and look into that. And what else do you notice about that dashboard? And then uh, after you're done with that, you scroll down and hopefully you'll, no you'll notice that there's a box called deposit policy with, and there is a Sherpa Romeo button. So you click there and that will bring you to the Sherpa Roma. I really like the interoperability of these two tools, where it's like, this is we're giving you the overview, but if you really wanna dig deeper into the uh, open access policy of that journal, just go there. We are not gonna try to reproduce that, I love it. So Sherpa Romeo um, then will display um, a list of journals and you pick that again, you click on whatever journal it is that you're doing. Um, and just go under the fold because the first very big top is like, go to the new tool. Don't go to the new tool. Just look be below and then click on, um, uh, on the name of the journal. And then we'll open a new page with, um, where you can see the policy of the three different levels, the published version. So like there's the version of the journal would publish and what's the policy around copyright and around things there. Then there is the uh, reviewed version, I forgot what it's called, but scroll down to the submitted version. And that's where you can find information about like self-archive, archiving policy. Also, if none of this makes sense, just look around. You don't have to answer all these questions. Don't stress out. I uh, just want you to just get a feel of that. All right, I understand it's a lot of steps. So I'm gonna stop. Again, if this is too much, just look at the website. It's really cool. <laughs> But uh, it, I, I think this is gonna be interesting. I don't know how many rooms, uh, I had four because that's what was in the prompt. Well, let's do three, um, choose whatever journal you wanna explore. It really doesn't matter. Um, but uh, yeah, and if you need help, click help. And I think I can also pop in or someone else from here. All right. Welcome back everyone. Hi. So you probably got stuck in a few spots because it's, I realized that I should have a screenshot or something, but um, hopefully something was uh, a, a surprise or a good discovery. 
Uh, we don't have a ton of time to just like debrief on everything, but I wonder if anyone wants to share uh, things that surprised them um, or, you know, what, what was this like? Maybe one person from each room and then we can move on or anyone can pop in. I can share. Thank you. So basically, I think it was very interesting to go through this. I've never gone through this before. And then we find like that the article that there is no, you don't need to pay to, 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 for the, to publish the article. We also found out that it, the, the, the journal was open science since 2010, which is quite a long time, and which we thought it was interesting. Uh, we couldn't find that information if the, the author could publish a preprint. But I think, yes, because it was written no embargo. I don't know if no embargo means that the person could publish it before. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to know what the no embargo means. Yeah, that's a good, good question. And it was also written there that it, the open publication could be in any platform, which we thought was interesting. Uh, what else? Oh, we entered all the uh, the kind of line license. Oh, I just forgot which kind of license it was. But I ah, uh, it was a Creative Commons attribution four point zero license, and yeah, it was really nice to to look through all the the features of the journal. And I think when I'm publishing an an article. Like when I'm submitting an article, I'll definitely look into it because it's nice to understand what is behind area of publication. Right. And then it's nice because it provides, I mean, I think that definitely this could be user experience improvement, but like it gives you like a dashboard with icons and then you can link and actually go to the journal policy and read it uh, more carefully. So that check um, or the think, check and submit uh, checklist has like, you know, just spend time before you sign a contract with the journal, like checking, is this, you know, trustworthy? And this is a good tool to do that. Um, yeah, please, Priya. And thank you for that. Actually, before you go, embargo. So uh, the embargo is like if you, it's a period, I don't know, I don't know, I'm not a vocabulary, but like it's a um, period of time in which like you can't share because the, the, the journal wants to retain the rights to make other people pay for that. So it's, is there an synonym of embargo? Is there someone that can explain that better in English than I can? Um, it's just a lock period, like I, um, you know, where you can't, even you as an author can't read it without paying, which is ridiculous unless your library is paying for a subscription. And the no embargo is the only possibility for open access because otherwise, if, I mean, I guess it's for brands, there are options, but like the, um, usually it's no embargo. There is a, it's open right away. As soon as it goes on the, on the it's published. But some, some papers have like years, like three years of embargo and that's not open access, right? Like they just make you pay to read it for three years or more. Exclusive time, thanks. Um, sorry, Priya. Or if you're still, oops. I lost the chat. Uh, I keep losing the chat. Oh, great. I'm so glad that it was it was helpful. Um, no worries. Also, I have kids making noise all the time. And Zoom is great at constantly that. <laughs> um, anyone else? Or we can I can resume. This was just, yes, let's keep going. All right, chop, chop. Um, I'm almost done. I have the last part, which is about preprints, which apparently I'm a great expert. Um, and I think I, I don't need, let's just slide show, sorry. And my mouse has issues. Um, you know, share. All right, so um, the part of the green open access route, um, I love 
the Turing Way and all of their beautiful um, images. This is like the many routes, many paths to open uh, access. And again, there is that train with the green and the golden diamond. But the, you see that at the top um, here, the preprints are a way for self-archive. And uh, some of those uh, Sherpa Romeo specifically said in the submitted version that you can submit to by your archive or a preprint server. Some just saying self-archive is okay, which includes preprints. Um, so, um, what is a preprint? Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, there are many definitions of preprints. Uh, this is one from uh, the Committee of Publication Ethics about preprints are a form of publication. Usually, it's a complete research manuscript that has like all of the parts that it's supposed to have. Um, with you know your hypothesis, your results, um, your conclusions and discussion. Um, your figures, um, and it's um, put up on the web uh, before it's peer reviewed by a journal, uh, before journal organized peer review. And so it's disseminated quickly. And usually um, it's also open access by default. The licenses can be different, but um, there's a tendency to have open uh, licenses CC by. We're going to see some of that and usually a no cost to the authors. I don't know what it is usually. I still have to find a preprint server that makes you pay. Um, but this is a, <laughs> that's the finish of COPE. I can't argue with that. Uh, this is a, a figure that I, uh, one of the first one I saw from uh, uh, Jessica uh, Polka presentation when she still was a director of Sabio. And it basically just it's nicely show you the dark side of publication through a journal uh, where you go through several iterations of peer review. So you have usually two to three reviewers selected by the editors that will review your manuscript and say, yes, no, yes, 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 if you're lucky, uh, or no, no, no. And then if they say no, 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 that you're rejected, then you go to the next journal and you do this again and again, it takes months. Um, and even when they say yes, 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 you still have to wait before the manuscript gets a stamp approval, it's published and you, by the end of it, you're already at the end of your second project and um, <laughs> part of it. Um, but preprints after this alternative um, and preprints have been around for more than 20 years in some spaces. So, so with the archive being the first preprint server founded in 1991 for um, um, more like mathematics um, and computational work. Um, but now we have more and more preprint servers. I'm gonna show you some, uh, but the best, so definitely highlights that speed of dissemination. And one of my favorite aspects of preprints is that they give us permission to rethink peer review, to rethink feedback and to explore ways to make community feedback more uh, participatory and independent of journal organized peer review. Now I send a lot of words that sound a lot of mouthful, but basically because the preprint is out there, anyone can give feedback to them by emailing the author at the very least, or by using some of the platforms like pre-review, hello, um, to uh, review the preprints. So preprints have, these are some of the uh, things that people highlight about positive aspects of preprints. You get feedback, as I said, you may get more collaborators um, because they, you know, they may see your work and they so wanna come in and do, Next work with you, they also give a product productivity to proof. Uh, preprints are have permanent uh, have PIDs, so they have DOIs, and they can be shared in your CV um, and as proof of um, a productivity. And in fact, uh, in 2016 or 15, something like that, is when NIH said you can put preprints in your bio sketch. And that made a huge difference because if you're applying for a job, if you're applying for a grant, as a, especially with an early career researcher, as a postdoc that is applying for one of those early, you know, investigator, independent investigator grants, putting the fact that you're putting a preprint out is so much faster that can have you kind of, you know, um, get accepted to a job, improve productivity, or get a grant so much easier than having to wait for a journal. Uh, there are things, aspects of reprints that people are very afraid of, which I think that that fear is real, the scoop. And here it's interesting because it's, it's, there is a scoop protection. Technically, that's why preprints were brought up to plant the flag and say, hey, I did it. No way you're going to do this before me. But there's definitely this idea, especially when journals weren't sure about if preprints would be something you know that is considered as a, uh, as a valuable um, 
piece of, of, of research put out, uh, the question of like, if I put out microprints and someone else can see it, do the work much faster or like, and then publish it in nature before I do. Um, I think that there are some valid aspects of that and I we don't have time to explore that, um, but there are also, there's no proof that that is true. Um, and you can look more on the SR bio, uh, they will show, they will link to some uh, research that has tried to, to look at that aspect. We have uh, one question, um, which might be good to ask in between slides. Uh, from Luciana, what is the difference between preprint and a head of print? Oh, I've never heard of that. Her head of print. I mean, the the word print should not even be there, right? Because nobody prints anymore. But it's a. Uh, um, does anyone else know the answer? I don't know what a head of print means. There is definitely a difference between preprint and submitted version, like those things that we were looking at Sherpa Romeo, like or um, the the preprint is just like I as an author decide that today is the day that I put it out there. I go on a preprint server and I submit it. And most preprint servers have like a little bit of checks and like the 24, 48 hours, they check if it's real. Like you're not saying like, I don't know, I can make, um, stardust with water um and then they put it out um and there's nothing about the publisher or the the review of the journal i don't know what a head of print means sorry if anyone has the answer oh there's there a little bit in the chat yeah, yeah just talking about um like i think a, a head of print may be referring to when an article has been accepted but hasn't okay. officially been published okay yeah so it's undergoing maybe copy editing and the last little check uh, from the okay yeah that's that is the difference and I mean uh, although some people decided that that's the time to put the preprint out for self archive reasons so it's not like everybody puts out their preprint ahead of time uh, way ahead of time a lot of most of the time in the last survey that bio archive did at least uh, most people were submitting their preprint at the same time just like minutes before submitting it to a journal just because in the submission to a journal you need to put the digital object identifier of your of the preprint. So it's not minutes, maybe hours, because you need. But basically, for example, uh, when I submitted my research to eLife, which was before they changed the model, uh, they wanted to know if there was another version already published in a preprint server. So I put it like the day before, I put it out on my archive, then I got the digital object identifier, and I put that number into the submission to eLife. Um, now eLife, if you don't do that, eLife won't even look at that, but that's another. Um, and the same, I think, some plus in other journals, but basically, yeah, um, then the head of print is um, when you can, you can possibly journals allow you to put a new version uh, out on a preprint server before, before they publish it. Sorry, it's complicated. Um, but I'm almost done. And I hear this is actually a slide from Mirace um, that I, I borrowed from her DAC. Um, and this is just like to, you know, it's preprints that have no publication fee, there's no paywall. Uh, they're um, uh, linked, they're, uh, they're present in a search like European C, uh, which is uh, the PubMed Central, Europe PubMed Central in indexes. Uh, and Google Scholar indexes per print, um, and they give more visibility. And there are studies that have shown that you get more citations if you put out per prints, um, up to 36% more. And this study is already dated, so I bet it's more. Um, oops. The uh, number of per prints that are published continues to increase, um, which makes me very hopeful uh, for the future. And uh, that are, if you want to publish a preprint, uh, you have so many preprint servers to choose. Uh, so here is another, you know, thing to check. But, um, you know, probably you want to check, like, for the best fit for your research. Uh, there is a nice directory that Esabio maintains. Um, there are new preprint servers every, I don't know, a uh, few months. One of the biggest that was announced was the preprint server that the Gates Foundation is going to use for their grip teeth. And it's called Ver Very Ver Archive. Um, we'll hear more about that preprint server in the months to come. Um, and you can, uh, some preprint servers have only one license and it's usually open license CC BY. 
some other preprint servers give you a choice, which I think BioArchive does. Um, and here, just uh, on the ESA bio, you can find more information about that. Uh, I think that's going with CC BY, which means that someone will need to attribute, um, can reuse the work, but need to attribute to the original source is what I would recommend the default being, but there's also like ways to feel more protected for like non-commercial uh, copyright so that others can use your work for making money, which sounds like a good deal. Um, so thank you, Creative Commons, for having this. No license is always a no-go. Don't do no license. If you don't have a license, um, it means closed by default. I'm going to sneak oh, in yeah. to ask another question. <laughs> this is from uh, Alejandra. If you publish a preprint with one journal, can you later publish with another journal? Yes. Yeah, so the preprint is completely independent from the journal. Uh, um, well, there are some journals like, um, you know, like Research Square and other, they have preprint servers for their own journals, like Springer Nature is linked. But if you, those preprint server, if you put it on preprint server, the journal comes later and it doesn't actually matter um to what journal you're going to submit now there are certain paths to that publication that include the preprint and so things are changing for and i'm going to confuse people here but for example peer community in is a great space where you can submit your preprint and ask for review and then that once it gets reviewed there it will be published in one of the journals that are associated with that preprint with that process but the preprint server itself, it's detached from. So it's like a way to put it out and get a persistent identifier. So there is no link with the journal. Sorry, it's complicated, but it's a great question. And I, I think that, um, we, you know, we definitely want to check with your journal if, if it's okay to publish a preprint. Usually it is and it's welcomed. And then um, it doesn't, you can also not know where you're going to publish afterwards. Usually it's, it's fine to put it in a preprint server. Is there any better way to answer that question? <laughs> Although I know the new ones of things that are changing and new protocols and new models. So it's like, but let me just give you an example. Uh, eLife uh, last year put a new model um, and other journals have done this before, but they call it the public review curate. So basically try to follow here. So if you, they only review preprints. So you have to put it in one of the preprint servers of your choice for them to consider your manuscript. If you don't have an appropriate server, they can help you put it in one. And usually it's by archive or meta archive because they publish life science, um, but it doesn't have to be. They put it in a, so you have a preprint server and then once it's a preprint, they'll say, okay, now we'll consider it for review. And the way that they say yes or no to you, it's not because of the reviews, but it's like, is this a good, like, can we do this? Like, is this, are we talking about things that actually Elife cares about? And so it's like an editorial decision. Once they say, yes, this is actually a manuscript that can be reviewed, they send it out to reviewers. And at that point, it's going to be accepted. It's accepted. So they review it. And then you iterate with this um, different publications and then get the reviews are all published and they're free and they are um, uh, open for anyone to see. Uh, and then at the end of this process, you may get the version of record with eLife if you want, or you can also say, you know what, Elias, thank you very much. I actually don't want to do this with you at the end and bring those reviews somewhere else or like, um, so like do that, um, the last process um, in the auto revisions and all that and kind of like um, submit it to another journal. It's complicated, there is more to it, but um, this is just like a one step ahead towards like, rethinking what peer review around preprints can do. And Society is a website that captures all of the different experiments and groups. I don't want to call it experiments anymore, but like I think it feels like that, uh, where we are trying, for example, pre-review, we're trying to do review of preprints with the community in an independent way from a journal. And this is increasing. This practice of reviewing preprints um, is, um, you know, you look at the Access is not as many thousands, but it's definitely increasing during the years. And the year of open science and top schools, 
The number two is this goal of improving transparency, integrity, and equity in reviews. And I really, really believe, of course, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I do, that preprint reviews is the way to do that and to get to that transparency, integrity, and equity in um, a collaborative way. I'm done. Thank you. Sorry, I ran really fast at the end. Um, uh, you can email me any questions and you can we can have a chat. Um, I love this group and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I think, Irena, you want to do a couple of final announcements. Um, Estras, we see your question about funders. It's not something we can answer in the time we have on the call. <laughs> um, but pop into a co-working or ask it in Slack because uh, we'd love to talk about it more. It's just it's a long answer. Um, can we have a huge round of applause for Daniela, please, folks? Yeah, there has to be one. It's necessary. Bring those emojis in, my friends. <laughs> thank you oh, congratulations this was done you're done you just now go back to your project <laughs> <laughs> Irene you want to wrap up yes thank you Joe so um, the uh, announcement that I want to make is just around the project presentations and as Daniela said um, this is the last training session I'm so so excited um, now to hear what your experience has been in the program and how you are being able to incorporate open science into your work. And the project presentations, uh, those are the opportunities um, for you to share with everyone in the cohort uh, about your projects, about your work, and about what connections you, ha you have been able to make between open science, all these concepts and tools that we have been learning about um, and how you link that to your work. So I just want to go really quickly over the guidelines for presentations and answer any questions that you might have. So I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Okay, I think you're seeing the slides now. And yeah, as I was saying, please consider this final assignment more uh, like a reflection exercise about your participation in the program and um, an opportunity to share your progress um, in your project or in your work in general. I know that not everyone has um, any specific project in mind, uh, but just let us know what connections you have made between open science and your general work. So the main requirement for the presentation is that you keep it under five minutes because we have many people participating and I know you're going to be really excited to share um, all about your projects, but please keep it under five minutes. Um, the format is free, so you're welcome to prepare slides or maybe just um, open your mic and um, talk that's okay as well. Um, if you're going to be using the slides, um, use at five at most, because again, we don't want to saturate the presentation. Um, and you can use one slide for each of the uh, sections of the presentation. So what we would like to hear from you is introduce yourself briefly. I know that you have been meeting one another during breakout rooms, um, but again, we're going to record the presentation so other people might also watch later in YouTube. Um, share a little bit about what have you been working on during the program um, and specifically focus on your learnings. Uh, what did you learn during the training and during the coaching sessions as well? And what connections did you identify between open science concepts or tools and your project? Um, and let us know what you plan in the future? How do you plan to apply open science in your future work? So those are the, the four, five points that we would like to hear from you. Um, we're gonna have two groups for uh, the project presentations. The first group will present next week. So that's next Thursday. 
um, and that's at the, I think it's the usual time. And then on week seven, um, we're gonna have the second group presenting as well. That's at an earlier time um, because we know some people prefer an earlier time and we want to hear from everyone. Um, so also if you're joining the, the program in a team, all of you will present only one presentation. So you don't have to do individual ones and just um, coordinate together to do um, one presentation. You can designate or choose one or more people from your team to present. But yeah, so this is um, in general what we want to hear um, in your project presentations. Again, just please take this as an opportunity to share your insights with the cohort. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and see in the chat if there are questions. Shall Irina, can I time? ask the Ooh. same question as uh, Daniela? Um, about if it would be useful for people to share their slides on Zenodo? I think it would be useful maybe after the presentation. Um, again, I couldn't say it's a requirement. Um, we keep a um, kind of community of OLS in Zenodo. That means that all presentations that participants in other years have shared are there and you can you know, browse them. Um, yeah, look at them. So if you want, if you are going to use the slides and you want to share them afterwards, um, yeah, you're you're welcome to do that. Um, and we, we can share the steps to do that in an email later or during the graduation calls. So that, that was the final announcement. And again, thank you everyone for joining. If there are uh, more questions, I'm gonna stay a few minutes after we stop the recording, uh, but also please feel free to send me an email or ask in the Slack because I imagine other people might be asking themselves the same question. So thank you, Daniela, um, all, um, again for joining us in, in the session. And thank you everyone for joining. I'm going to stop the recording now.